Y bien, y para continuar, le damos la bienvenida al doctor Sebastián Botrich, quien nos hablará sobre el Internet de las Cosas y su implementación en Europa. El doctor Butrich se desempeña como jefe del Laboratorio de Investigación en la Universidad IT de Copenhague, desarrollador e, y, y entrenador en el Network Startup Resource Center y profesor del Centro Internacional de Física Teórica. Como gestor, promotor y profesor, se especializa en redes inalámbricas, tecnología abierta y libre, sistemas embebidos, generalizados, energía solar, redes de sensores inalámbricos en ciencias del medio ambiente, espacios en blanco de televisión y el espectro dinámico. Es cofundador de wire.les.dk y coautor de, de los libros Redes Inalámbricas en los Países en Desarrollo, Espacios Blancos para TV y un Enfoque Pragmático, Bajo Costo de Impresión en 3D para la Ciencia, la Educación y el Desarrollo Sostenible. Butrich tiene un doctorado en física de la Universidad Técnica de Berlín en Alemania, con enfoque en física cuántica, óptica, espectroscópica de radio y programación científica. Así que démosle la bienvenida al ingeniero Butrich. Hello, everybody. First of all. I feel very honored and grateful to be able to be here. It's my first time in Colombia, and it already feels great. I hope it's not the last time I will be here. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the Internet of Things in Europe. That's only half true. I'm going to split my talk about half-half into making some general statements, general points of view on the Internet of Things. The second part then will be specifically about implementations in Europe. As has been said in the introduction, I have kind of two hats on. I work at the IT University of Copenhagen in Denmark. Denmark, I just read in the last ITU uh, report on the measuring the state of the information society, I think it's called. Um, Denmark just made the number one spot as the best connected, highest developed internet country in the world. It is true we have a 95 plus percent connectivity internet penetration in Denmark, small country, very privileged. Um, I also work in a global context with the Network Startup Resource Center, which aims to bring internet connectivity to less privileged places on this earth. Both angles will hopefully be present in my view on Um, the Internet of Things. Here's a few first slides that I'm going to actually jump over because I promise to win some time. The important things in here, I can just as well say, the Internet of Things, a term that comes from the late 90s actually, mostly talks about machine to machine things rather than people. However, I found it very important this morning when the minister gave his talk We shouldn't forget that everything we do here has to be about people, has to be about social impact. If we forget that, little value in the Internet of Things. Um, just as a bit of historical funny thing to remember, the first device ever on the Internet was in 1982 at Carnegie Mellon in Institute, and it was a Coke machine which reported its state of how many Cokes have I ha do I have and are they cold enough for drinking. So this is how long the term actually goes back. Only recently it's become very trendy again to think about the Internet of Things. But it's not a new term as such. The factors I see have driven the success of the Internet of Things, that we are now looking at this revolutionary growth in things connecting to the Internet. There's a few factors here. The incredible rise of RFID tags and the prices going down like crazy. Then, of course, mobile phones, mobile data, mobile sensors have driven the idea. And last but not least, and I'll come back to that, the availability of free open frequencies in different ways. Most of all, the so-called ISM, Industrial Scientific Medical Bands, 
and what we all know, Wi-Fi, I would, I don't like to use the term revolution, but what we've seen between the year 2000 and now has at least been a drastic change of our views on connectivity. Um, others before me have no, mentioned some business outcasts. We're expecting by the year 2020 to have around 20 to 30 billion things on the net. 2008 was the year when the number of things on the net for the first time was bigger than the number of people on this planet. Might have been a year later or something. Um, I think the talk before me uh, talked quite nicely about what industries is it actually. And you can, you can definitely say buildings, infrastructure, transport are strong. Home and consumer, home appliances, smart home is a, is a driver. Um, cities and industry is a driver. And we've only seen the beginning of this. Like in this picture, most, we, we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg. The most is yet to come in the, in the, in the year to come up to 2020. The way I see it, the Internet of Things is almost always connected to an idea of being smart. We're talking about smart devices, smart homes, smart cities, then even bigger entities, smart systems, and systems connecting to each other. I would encourage us, though, to, to think for a moment what we actually mean by smart. What is a smart home? Is that a home that when I come home, like I remember from one Internet of Things commercial, it's, it's saying your, your home will actually know what mood you're in because it knows what you've done during the day. It knows what meetings you had. It can measure your pulse. It can measure your brain waves. And it will automatically choose the right music for you. Is that the smart home I really want? Or is it a home that optimizes my energy consumption? So I encourage us to think about people when we say smart. What do we actually mean by smart? In the home context, very often, yes, it's about energy, water, keeping the doors shut when they should be shut, maybe heating the home 15 minutes before I come home, these kinds of things. But let's not become all too uncritical about the term smart in general. Very briefly about the network options for the Internet of Things. And I think talks after me will go much deeper into that. What we are working with mainly uses some of these, Wi-Fi, Zigbee, definitely mobile 3G, 4G, 5G. We're doing Bluetooth a lot, especially low energy Bluetooth 4. Um, in very remote places, actually even satellite connections, direct sensor to satellite has become interesting again because it's actually become quite affordable, which wasn't the case, for example, 10 years ago. Um, yeah, I will not go into much more detail here. We have networking options today for, I would say, all kinds of distances, all kinds of reach, all kinds of data rates that we might be needing. With that, I come in the context of this conference here a bit to talk about frequencies. Now, most of the things we're talking about, they, de they do not produce a lot of data, but they do it all the time. And they might be extremely hard to reach. The presentation we saw from the vineyard from Don Daniele was a very good example. We had this camera tucked away under the, the grapes. It didn't actually need very much. It needed, what, 30K or something as a transfer. But it did that all the time and very far away and through the leaves and everything. For those of you, I apologize, I am a physicist by background, so I like to talk about physics. The physics of this tell us that we want to use low frequencies. We are mostly interested in lower frequencies because they go further, they go through things, they go around.
around things rather than looking at higher gigahertz. This is what mostly interests us and already giving a bit of a lead to something that you'll hopefully hear about uh, later. We're very interested in what you could call the TV white spaces or with a wider term dynamic spectrum axis in the frequency ranges that used to be taken by TV. And I trust others can say more about this later than I have to do at this point. So we are mostly, this is where we are mostly playing, whether it's on existing ISM bands around 900 or 800 something, or the 433 around here, or hopefully in the future, these bands. These are of central interest to us when we're talking Internet of Things. The dynamic spectrum axis I mentioned is linked to terms like cognitive radio, software-defined radio. Very simplified. I can imagine um, radio devices to be one of three kinds. Either they're just dumb devices that can do one frequency and that's all, or they can be intelligent devices that find their right frequency autonom autonomously by listening around them and choosing a free frequency, or they could be asking a geodatabase that tells them what frequency is available in their position. I will make the personal comment, though, that I don't think this is politically accepted in many places on this planet. And on top of that, in many, especially rural environments, there is little reason to do this because they are essentially empty when it comes to use of these frequencies. But I've marked my personal take on this here in red. Now, another kind of sort of strong statement. If you want business traction, if you want something succeed in this ecosystem that we heard about this morning in the minister's talk, you have to open up the system, open up the spectrum in some way. What does some way mean? This could be ISM type, like Wi-Fi. This could be light licensing. This could take various forms. It could be mixtures of what we've seen so far. But you will need to open it in some way. Why? This is a distribution of where does data traffic these days actually happen on smartphones. On mobile networks? No, only minority. The huge amount of data, and it's actually even more in Europe, travels on un unlicensed spectrum. That's basically where the trend is going. This is the sales of devices from 2008 to 2014. Licensed only devices are dropping. Those that combine it or only offer unlicensed, massive growth. Today, the most data and the most buck for money, the most value, the most business money travels on unlicensed spectrum. For us, like in my day-to-day -day role, I do a lot of hands-on building things, building sensors. It means that today, as end users, we can get fully functionable TCP IP devices doing Wi-Fi for under $5. We can do Bluetooth at I wouldn't even say just a few dollars, in the dollar range. And we can get embedded PCs with gigahertz CPUs way under $10. That has a huge implication also for what we're able to do in education. Remember, people are still in the center of what we're doing. The comment has been made in all of this, we will need IPv6 unless we want to hide all our sensors behind some gateways if we want to expose things to the internet, if we need all these tens of billions of numbers, there's no alternative. We are doing IPv6. The sensors that I'm talking of, we have these for almost any physical phenomenon we can talk about. If it can turn a physical phenomenon, a physical property into a voltage, then we can also build a sensor for it all kinds of environmental um, 
you name it, we have it. Focus for us at the moment is very much water, agricultural, air quality, and so forth. The sensors exist. Another thing that was mentioned, just to quickly give you an idea of the order of magnitude, Internet of Things is tightly coupled to the idea of big data. Today we are kind of, this is what I have at home for storage, terabyte disks, not, not that expensive anymore. This is what we produce per day on the Internet today. Each of this is a step of 1,000 times more. And it's projected that up to the year 2025, we will have made five more such steps. It's quite something to think about, and it comes with a lot of challenges. I'm not going to look much into the more technical challenges up here, how to store and manage and so forth. I would want to remind us that we have huge challenges about the ethics of data handling and the politics of data, data handling. If your home reports all your activities to the net, when are you sleeping? What are you listening to? What are you eating? How are you feeling? Who owns these data? Who protects these data? Does Facebook have access to these data? Can they send you ads based on how you're feeling? These are all ethical questions that come with big data that we're only beginning to understand. Now, unfortunately, big data doesn't mean necessarily that we gather more information, gain more knowledge, or even wisdom out of that. It's nice to believe that more data means more understanding. But here's a funny proof that that's not the case. This is a, a quite funny website that strictly just looks at data sets and does correlations between data. And what we can see here very strongly is that the U.S. spending on science, space, and technology strongly correlates with suicides by hanging, strangulation, and suffocation. That is data analysis. Check out this website. It's endless fun. But I'm not trying to be funny here. What I'm trying to say is unless we combine big data with big understanding, the data alone can give me anything. And you can actually mathematically prove the more data you have, the better the chances that you create false theories. That can be proven. I didn't say it as a joke. Another skeptical remark here is a smart connected city, all very well. Everything is on the internet. But it, it's also very easy to bring this city to a complete standstill. Imagine you have a flood pre-warning system or a radiation warning system. I've worked with Asian uh, colleagues on radiation, like radioactivity monitoring. What if I can insert false data into these cities and make the city believe that it has a crisis and needs to evacuate, evacuate everybody? It's not just theory. Just a couple of days ago, the US actually said, we strongly believe that our power net actually can be shut down from outside. Whether that's a political reason they're saying this, that's another question. This is an interesting virus that was found just a couple days ago. It's been there for six years. Nobody had known it. The reason this virus region was designed leads us to think that it can only have been designed by one of the superpowers on this planet. And the distribution of countries that it's attacked probably gives us an idea where it comes from. What I'm trying to say here is let's not forget the more we connect cities, communities, people, the more we also have to think about the vulnerability. Here's a few first tasters. This is taken from a website that collected private camera pictures from all over the world and put them public on the net. These were things in smart homes. This is a smart camera at a smart home watching a smart, smart baby. It wasn't so smart that they hadn't changed the password. And there were hundreds of thousands of these. This here is a car. 
somebody has hacked himself into the car. A car today has many wireless sensors. And somebody has manipulated the speed reading. It's been proven that they could actually leave the air out of the tires by wirelessly hacking that car. Just as reminders of what security issues come with the Internet of Things. With that, and yes, I'm half time, that's not too bad. I'm going to talk a bit more about a European view on Internet of Things. At this point, we are always saying Internet of Things, so and so much business in there, but what are we actually talking about when we say an Internet company? There's certainly the com companies that build sensors, nodes, gateways, and servers receiving those data. But there's an awful lot more to this. There's data management, networks, legal handling of data will become a business in its own right. A map of some new Internet of Things companies in Europe. Needless to say, many of these are actually global companies. The talk we just heard about Silver Spring Networks was one example. Here's just a few that I know of. I don't claim to be complete here or favor anybody, but this is companies that we've seen emerging on the European market. Libellium actually deriving their technology from a, a platform we're going to see later, the Arduino platform. Um, they've become quite successful doing all kinds of things like smart agriculture, smart water, smart, smart city uh, sensor systems. Another one we've worked with is Solatia, also from Spain, interestingly enough. But these are just pointers. My, my own view is that the main actors is probably not going to be these companies delivering to certain industries. But it will probably be utilities, energy, transportation that are driving the Internet of Things. And I very much agree with what, I, what we heard before, that energy probably is the main driver. I'm going to get back to that. When I was asked about talk, to talk about implementation in Europe, my first reaction was like, I can't do that because it doesn't exist. There is not one European Internet of Things Im Im implementation. Not yet. What we are seeing is many, many parallel, you could call them intranets of things. Somebody is doing this, somebody is doing this. You see vertical connections, but you see little interconnection in between them. And the players are all there. It's private companies, it's the public sector. But even within the EU, we have many barriers. For example, the telecommunications sector, we still don't have mobile roaming freely from one country to the other in Europe. When I travel from Denmark to Germany, my data rates change completely. My, my, what I have to pay for my transfer of data changes. We are on the way there. We're trying to become one Europe, but we're not there yet. Um, please don't read all of this. Um, I trust you can get these presentations later. A brief view on the Horizon 2020 program. The Horizon 2020 program is the European, the largest funding program for research and development and for enabling new industries and technologies. Within this program, we have an Internet of Things platform. It's not exactly huge at about 560 million euro. If you look at the total size of the program, which has 24 billion up here in science, 40 billion here. The reason I'm showing this is actually this, where the Horizon 2020 program talks about its challenge. It's talking about overall challenge to extend into a web of platforms, different platforms that are not connected today. And the red one here is 
definitely the important one. The biggest challenge will be to overcome the fragmentation. Because this is what we have today. We have intranets of things. Now imagine all vendors trying to succeed in the marketplace with each their approach. How do we interconnect this? How do we build open systems, open standards that everybody can talk? And this is what all the European activities, here we have the, the research cluster for the Internet of Things. They are using the term ways to realize the Internet of Things vision, clearly accepting that we are nowhere close. The same here, the um, European Commission support the emergence of an ecosystem. Again, indicating we are only starting to look at how we're building this. And the, here's the Internet of Things Applications Conference, the advent of ubiquitous connectivity. Everything here says we are only at the starting point of building this. Um, energy is likely to be the strongest player in this. And I'm going to illustrate this a little bit and why it will be driving the Internet of Things so much. Because we'll be building completely new types of grids. Take a look at this picture. This is the small Danish island of Bornholm. Small island, I mm, don't know how many people actually. Well, it's, it's about 40 kilometers uh, long or 50 kilometers. Its new energy mix will be private solar, windmills, electric cars. There will also be traditional um, power plants. This is a completely new infrastructure which is being tested out. Here it's IBM as the main IT supplier, by the way. This will heavily rely on intelligent sensors, systems reporting to the overall grid, to make this workable. And Denmark is often called a good test lab for this because it's so tiny. Denmark has only 5 million people, keep that in mind. And this is, again, a picture which illustrates this new mix of things that we're trying to be building. We can actually, for Denmark, watch this in real time. We can see how Denmark trades energy with its European neighbors all the time. We might be exporting on the one side while we're importing on the other side. And it's happening on a second by second scale, negotiated by measurements and uh, price information. That's the challenge of building the future energy systems. With that, I'm jumping into maybe five minutes of talking a little bit about my own university and what we're doing. This is the place. And this picture here. I include it to actually rem remind me of, of something which we haven't talked so much about. The Internet of Things is a beautiful, beautiful inspiration for education and teaching. This morning, the minister said, this is no longer mainly about technology. This is about people learning. Now, here is somebody sitting, and they've actually got many things here. They're actually building sensors and mini servers and infrastructures, and they forgot to take away their plates. Um, we can today give students technology in the range of some $10, which empowers them to learn the Internet of Things in ways that we've never seen before. And at my university currently, this is exploding in popularity among students. I think that's an aspect in the Internet of Things that we shouldn't forget. My university has done this kind of thing. We're relatively new. We've only existed for 15 years. But we've done this under different names right from the beginning. And a lot of that happens at the lab that I'm running, which is called the PIT Lab, Pervasive Interaction Technology Lab. This is the technologies we're playing with. Here's the tiniest one. I forgot to put something for measure. This is about the size of a fingernail. And it's a full-blown small computer capable of running 30K, 30 kilo memory programs. It's, you can see, for those of you who are engineers or something like that, you can see four pins on each side. That gives you the size of this. This, the Raspberry Pi, a mini computer. It's about this size big. 
$30, a full-blown computer capable of letting students study everything that you can study on a computer. This uh, as a reminder of the educational impact. Things we do with sensors, we recently built a bicycle-based air pollution measurement system. You clip on a little thing on your bicycle, and as you go through town, or you bike through town, you measure the air quality, various gases, air humidity, and we're sending this in real time to maps, Google Map, OpenStreetMap. That's a recent project in my lab, which we're extending to cooperate with other universities and use it all over town. Energy within the building. Cheap, self-built things measure energy consumption in the building. What is this? Our battery is low. It says here. OK. It doesn't show there. That's fine. Um, without doing anything but just measuring and learning, we could, we could lower our energy consumption 10% within one year. No changes, meaning we didn't change the building. We didn't buy new equipment. All we did was learning through smart sensors where we are actually using the energy. And then we made small adjustments. So we're only just starting. We want to reduce by 30 40% over the next few years. Um, this I should. This is a, another energy-related theme. Oops. Totally different context, inspired by an African project, a mini grid, a micro grid of solar units. You see the same things embedded here, Arduinos and sensors that are reporting the energy production and consumption, sending this to a main unit, talking to a web application, and making these guys negotiate. If you have energy and I need it, I'm going to put it through to you enabled by smart sensors and putting these on the net. This last one here is something that we're only starting with. We are embedding sensor and data into gaming engines. If anybody f of you is in touch with the gaming industry, Unity is a very popular gaming engine there. And we're using this to model buildings this is parts of our own building. And then we're putting the sensor information into these gaming environments so people can actually go through these buildings and look at energy consumptions, energy flows, and so forth. And my last slide is a reminder of a upcoming workshop at the ICTP in Italy, again, together with my organization, NSRC. It's a workshop on scientific applications for the Internet of Things. If anybody of you is interested in this direction, the deadline is the 12th of December. And it's still open for applications. And with that, I want to come to say thank you. And maybe I'll let you decide if we have time for some questions. Sí, muchas gracias. Mi nombre es Javier Camargo de México, Ericsson. Eh, Realmente todas las presentaciones de la mañana han sido fabulosas, igual que esta, y sí me han creado muchas inquietudes. Y yo creo que la principal, hoy la, la comentaron, es sobre qué pasa si no existe compatibilidad entre las diferentes redes de las cosas, cuando se conectan de, en, la, en un mismo país, diferentes regiones o diferentes áreas. ¿Qué pasa? ¿Se va a poder hacer o se tiene a fuerzas que manejar un estándar universal para todos? Yo creo que la industria móvil ha sentado un precedente de manejar un estándar mundial. ¿Pudiera pasar lo mismo para el Internet de las cosas? Gracias. I'm guessing, I, I, I can guess a little bit what the question was about. I'll give you the first <laughs> shot on that, and then maybe I'll... 
Por, por alusiones, a ver. Yeah. Eh, eh, bueno, muy buena pregunta, muy buena pregunta. Eh, vamos a ver, eh, yo creo que estamos en una fase más, no estamos en una fase tan madura como en el, la telefonía móvil, es decir, estamos unos años más atrás y pues estamos todavía en la fase en la que eh, muchos fabricantes están intentando impulsar su estándar, lo que llaman estándar, pero que realmente son protocolos propietarios, etc. Además, en México tenéis muchos ejemplos de, de este tipo de cosas. Eh, sí que hay estándares que están en, en proceso como el 802.15.14, que está a punto de ser eh, aprobado. Eh, no, perdón, 815.4, eh, para, para toda la parte de, de radiofrecuencia, comunicaciones en radiofrecuencia. También hay estándares en PLC. Eh, en PLC sí que es cierto que eh, todavía no se ha llegado a un estándar unificado. PLC es transmitir información por la, por la línea de, de la electricidad. Eh, pero nosotros creemos que eh, el estándar que se va a quedar dentro de dos años, tres años, es el 802.15.4, que es el que, se, el que va a aprobar el, 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 el IE cubo y que es el que creemos que se va a establecer y que es el que por, por el que estamos apostando nosotros. Ahora, a día de hoy, a día de hoy, no existe un estándar oficial que valga en todas las partes del mundo y que esté aprobado por todo, todo. O sea, que es un poco un pupurrí que, bueno, eh, pues le quedará un poquitín más de tiempo hasta que se estabilice todo. No sé qué... I will comment like I think I understood the question. It, it's about how do we bring all these together in one standard. You gave a wonderful ex example. You said your company works with the street lighting system in Copenhagen. Now, obviously, it would make sense if what you are doing would also talk to the power grid system in Copenhagen, because that may, might have an impact on the street lighting. So there we have two verticals. How do these verticals talk together? And then we have to think about international co collaboration. How does the vineyard in Italy speak the same language as the vineyard in Colombia? Or is it maybe not important? Maybe it's enough if they both have gateways that can share some high-level information. Maybe the temperature and the sunlight in the Italian vineyard isn't that important for you in Colombia. So we have to do very smart decisions also about what does not need to be connected, but what open standards can we find to share the information that we want to share. Energy was one field. The energy market in Europe is absolutely international. It's cross-border all the time. So we need shared standards to negotiate that. But even legislation is a challenge. European countries have different standards on data protection, data retention. So the whole legal synchronization of this, there's a lot of work to do, which by far extends the the main theme of this conference, which is frequency, where we, of course, also need the cooperation and the shared standards. But it goes a lot further than this. Yeah. Yes. Uh, <coughs> okay, my voice is even worse than before. Eh? <laughs> uh, <coughs> good, uh, good to accelerate and give a fast answer. Uh, the thing is this. There is an intermediate layer that is uh, internet, that is already standardized. So the problem uh, is before and after. Sensors, they need a lot of standardization. The interconnection between sensors is intelligence. I mean, the microprocessor follows uh, separate standards, and these are totally, uh, most of them are proprietary. And then there is the part of intelligence of the background, the real intelligence, the smart, the servers, as uh, Sebastian was saying, uh, how can I implement a server that uh, is, can apply the similar uh, decision making in different uh, countries and in different scenarios and context? It is possible because we handle internet in different scenarios in the same way. So it is possible to implement uh, so those uh, servers, but it requires uh, merging different needs all together in the same time. Eh, tenemos muy poco tiempo, aquí surge una pregunta, si quieres por favor que sea muy corta y también pues, las respuestas uh -huh. de igual manera, ¿vale? para que podamos agilizar eh, el proceso. Actually, it's not really a question. Um, Internet of Things is about the physical world, and the physical world has physical measurements. We have standards for almost anything. 
from weights to time to so um, radiation and so on. Uh, why we need the standards at, uh, at the lower level when we can convert everything in the cloud and, and reconvert it in uh, information? It is true that on the, you could say, the lowest level physical properties, how to sense, we do have standards. We also do have standards in sense of networking. My question would be what shared standards do we need in terms of handling these data, basing decision making processes on these data, sharing these data with neighbors. Imagine, just imagine the, you have two cities that need to synchronize their decisions about traffic in some way. This could be cross borders of a country. That is more the standards that I'm thinking of. On the physical layer, being a physicist, I absolutely agree. I'm not missing much there in standards. If you report so and so much PPM of a certain chemical in water to me, I understand that regardless of borders and stuff. That is, I, I, I fully agree with you there. The question is more on the higher levels, not so much on the, the basics. Bien, tú querías hacer una pregunta, vamos con la última pregunta y continuamos. Buenas tardes. Eh, llegué un poco tarde a la exposición esta mañana, pero lo poco que pude captar. Ricardo Bautista de AIC. Eh, la pregunta va encaminada a la, al Internet de las Cosas con las teorías emergentes, cómo las vamos a enlazar. Y segundo, que preocupa desde el punto del medio ambiente, sería la relación... ¿O qué va a ser más peligroso en el futuro? Si el CO2 o el espectro electromagnético. This one I would actually need in translation. And the reason we're opening up was also not that uh, it's necessarily me answering these questions. If anybody else, um, I, th I thought it was nice to open up for a few discussion points, but it doesn't have to be me. Okay, okay. If this question was for me, then okay. please translate it. No, no, dice que cualquiera puede responder, yes. pero entonces nos vamos para donde el español que, yeah. que, que ya está escuchando perfectamente todas las preguntas. Let's avoid the English guy. <laughs> He doesn't follow the standard. ¿Me eh, podéis repetir la pregunta? <laughs> <risa> Está, estaba hablando con mi compañero y no. Y no. Es, eso son dos preguntas en una, ¿eh? Pues dos, dos, do, dos y media, dos y media. A ver, a la segunda pregunta de la radiación, eh, además creo que, que la agencia del espectro tiene, un, tiene, tiene estudios y tal. Eh, yo creo que ya se ha comprobado prácticamente a nivel mundial que las radiaciones electromagnéticas no son perjudiciales. Es decir, el CO2. Eh, bueno, pues sí que es perjudicial, ¿no? Y es que está, está causando el gas invernadero. Las radiaciones electromagnéticas, siempre y cuando estén dentro de los límites de potencia, no son perjudiciales. Estamos todos con el teléfono aquí, que está emitiendo ondas a tu cerebro. Y no sé, no se están dando casos de, de, pues eso, de problemas y tal, ¿no? Entonces yo creo que el, comparando el CO2 con, la, con el electromagnetismo, la respuesta está clara. Es como comparar fumar con una manzana. Bueno, no, quizá no tanto, pero... <risa> y luego, y, y la, otra, la otra pregunta era sobre eh, conectar nuevas tecnologías al Internet de las cosas. Yo creo que eso lo, 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 va, lo, va, lo va a determinar el mercado, es decir, eh, habrá cosas que eh, sí que requieran conectividad, como por ejemplo pues un, un marcapasos o cualquier cosa que tenga que estar enviando información a tu médico o cosas así, cosas que requieran la conectividad, pues sí que en la, propia, la propia industria, el propio mercado será el que bueno, pues, eh, impulse eh, la creación de esos productos. Otras tecnologías, pues yo creo que no será, no, no será necesario, es decir, me, conectar todo, tiene que haber una, 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 un, un argumento, tiene que haber una razón para conectar todo, conectar por conectar es invertir y bueno, o hay un caso de negocio para que alguien invierta, o nadie va a invertir. Entonces, habrá tecnologías que sí y habrá tecnologías que no, creo yo. ¿eh? No, tampoco soy un experto en esto. Bien. Eh, I would ah, like to make a quick comment. The, the medical sector is a wonderful example for this need for standardization and developing open standards. It's intensely discussed in Europe at the moment. Like, can we find a publicly agreed standard and formats so that we can share medical information between different countries, between different doctors and different technology. 
so that sensor, like whoever does health IT related technology knows, okay, I will have to speak this standard to communicate my data with others. And then the quick comment, I would maybe be a little bit more careful about the does radiation like electromagnetic waves have any health indication. You could make the cynical comment, we'll never find out because we'll never have a lab without electromagnetic radiation again on this planet. It's sort of too late to find out because we don't really have the, the case to compare it with anymore. It's true there is no direct indication until now that any of this is heavily endangering our health. But I would probably be a little bit more conservative saying there is no risk whatsoever. Buenas tardes. Nos surgió una pregunta y es acerca de la relación que existe entre el Internet de las cosas y el ancho de banda o los estándares mínimos de ancho de banda que tiene cada país. ¿Existe un mínimo de ancho de banda requerido para que puedan funcionar eh, todas las aplicaciones del Internet de las Cosas? ¿Hay alguna recomendación hablando también de, del tema de estándares? I, I'm not quite sure if you are asking about the bandwidth for the individual sensors or for the handling of all of these data. Um, I think we'll hear a lot more about networking standards later. Most sensors are very, very low bandwidth and you, you can't even say you need a minimum bandwidth because some sensors, if for example, if you have a temperature sensor in a field, in a vineyard, and all you ask for is give me the temperature once an hour, you are transferring two digits, two bytes maybe, once an hour. That is valuable scientific information, but almost no bandwidth. And that is what many sensors have in common, very small amounts of data. But please let it be reliable over a long time, over months and years. So in this direction, yes, there is minimum requirements, but we're meeting them with all this. We have enough technology to meet them. Then there's the other question, if we're really producing brontobytes of data at some point in the future, how will the backbone of the internet be able to handle all this? And that might pose questions for countries with less developed infrastructure, countries without a fiber backbone, countries that only rely on uh, radio links maybe. But this is, yeah, th there are really two questions. Bien, vamos con la última pregunta por este lado, ¿vale? Eh, buenas tardes. Eh, hemos hablado de Internet para las cosas, conectarnos cada vez más dispositivos, pero ¿cómo vamos a garantizar la seguridad de que no nos hackeen? Vimos la semana pasada que hackearon más de 200.000 cámaras web, entonces, ¿cómo, desde las iniciativas que estamos haciendo para conectarnos todos, cómo garantizamos también la seguridad de que no se vaya todo para la nube y todo el mundo quede expuesto? Oh, can somebody else please answer that question? Be <laughs> because I can't. No, s s simply saying, so far, even the highest security systems on this planet have shown compromises. We cannot, as human beings, guarantee absolute security for this. I think much more what we need to think about is make good decisions about what needs to be exposed on the internet. Maybe my baby cam does not need to be on the open internet. Maybe I should think twice before I do that. Maybe my music taste and how I'm doing at this moment doesn't really belong on the internet. Of course, we all give it to the internet because we're all writing Facebook status updates. I'm happy. I'm sad, <laughs> and it's being analyzed all the time. And maybe it's not a huge security risk to know that you are happy. But there's other information, and I gave you some examples. Radiation, early warning systems, flood warning systems. Can I tell the city it, there's a flood coming? Or shutting down an electricity network? Or 
in a crisis situation, I just shut down my enemy's frequency database. So there is huge, huge cha challenges. And I don't think anybody should dare at the moment to say, we have an answer. We have a lot of work to 